Hi there, my name is Pamela Oliveira, and on this show, you are going to find out what is happening in Brazil. So let's begin with this week's top stories. President Jair Bolsonaro's first address to the UN General Assembly as Brazil's head of state was marked by false and misleading claims that contradict his own government policies. While the president claimed to be on the side of indigenous peoples, he also advocated for mining activities in indigenous protected lands. He also denied that deforestation has increased in the Amazon, even though the numbers show deforestation has surged by nearly 70% this year over the same period last year. Having the indigenous YouTuber Isani Calapalo included in Brazil's delegation in New York has also sparked criticism from leaders of 14 peoples from the Xingu territory and the Xingu Indigenous Land Association. The indigenous leaders released a statement saying that the government's attitude was disrespectful, as it disregarded the names appointed by their representatives for national and international events, while also promoting an indigenous woman who has worked to demoralize indigenous leaderships. Brazilians held several demonstrations on September 20th as part of the global climate strike. In Sao Paulo, women from the Landless Workers' Movement protested outside the Brazilian headquarters of the German multinational corporation Bayer. The Landless Women denounced the anti-environment policy implemented by Jair Bolsonaro. Not only has the president encouraged deforestation and fires, but his government has also approved more than 320 pesticides in only nine months in office. Bayer became the world's largest producer of pesticides in genetically modified crops after buying Monsanto in 2018. In one rally last week, demonstrators performed the deaths caused by the political and economic project that has been poisoning communities, a project that is carried out by agribusinesses and multinational corporations like Bayer. On September 20th, eight-year-old Agatha Felix was returning home with her family in the Complexo do Alemão slums in Rio de Janeiro when she was shot in the back, reportedly by a police officer. The case has shocked local residents and sparked outrage on social media against Rio's far-right governor, Wilson Witzel. Witzel was elected last year with an aggressive public security platform. In eight months since he took office in January, more than 1,200 people have been killed by law enforcement agents in Rio. Also this year, 16 children have become victims of armed violence in the state. Five have died. Human rights organizations underscore that Governor Witzel's policies and remarks have been actively encouraging law enforcement against black and poor people in Rio's impoverished communities, who not only face police brutality on a daily basis, but also struggle in the hands of paramilitary groups, the so-called militias. These clandestine paramilitary groups are made up of current former police officers and carry out criminal activities while also enjoying support from the state. That makes it hard, for example, to have their crime solved and the perpetrators punished. Our story of the week is the Marielle Franco case about a Brazilian council women and human rights activist. She and her driver were brutally murdered on March 14th, 2018 in Rio de Janeiro. One year and a half later, the crime is still unsolved and the main suspects are militia members. For more than a year, Brazilians have been fighting for an answer to the question. Who ordered the murder of Marielle Franco? At age 38, Councilwoman Franco was being driven home after attending an event by black women when a car drove by and shot her and her driver. Marielle was acknowledged for her long history fighting for human rights and standing up for women and black and LGBT people in the city of Rio de Janeiro. A year later, two men were arrested over the killing of Marielle and Anderson Silva, who was driving her home, but it is still unclear who ordered the crime. And this case is not an exception. A 2017 survey showed that only 12% of homicide cases reported in Rio de Janeiro in 2015 were solved. One of the reasons that may help explain such low rates is the paramilitary groups that operate in large areas of Rio de Janeiro state. The so-called militias are often composed of former and serving police officers. 
They control life in the city slums, carry out contract killings, and operate within the state apparatus, which makes it harder to solve crimes. We have seen many lines of investigation, and we feel very concerned that they may be a huge smoke screen to hide the real issue. I think the state is being really negligent and scornful about this case. Born in Rio de Janeiro favela, Marielle Franco fought at the monthly against the militias. And although they tried to silence her voice, she became a global symbol of resistance. I will say this, not as Marielle's partner, but as a human rights activist. To me, Monica, Marielle represents resistance and revolution. On today's Culture Talk, we are going to meet a movement that has been changing cordial literature, one of Brazil's most traditional forms of folk poetry. The members of this new movement are using poetry to address social issues. Eu disse, sou de um planeta que só vive em pé de guerra, onde fabricam doenças, onde a justiça mais erra, uma gaiola de loucos com o nome Planeta Terra. Cordial literature is a kind of folk rhyming poetry that comes from oral tradition. It's usually produced as cheap paper bootlegs and displayed for sale hanging from a string, or corda in Portuguese, where the name Cordel comes from. This kind of poetry originated in medieval Europe, and flourished in North and Northeast Brazil. Cordel literature can be about all kinds of things, but in the dry backlands of the state of Rio Grande do Norte, some Cordel poets and singers are focusing their poetry on social and progressive subjects. Antonio is one of them. He says the views about what subjects to write and sing about and how to do it have changed. I usually say that Cordell has become a window to social issues. The way that we do it is different now. In the past, the black character was always the band. But now we have changed that. I truly believe in what I write. And I also truly believe in the work of other states and the school we have here. A school of Cordell about social issues. Crispiniano is also part of the movement that creates cordial poetry about social issues, and he's writing a book about it. Here, we have a small sample of what we have produced from a left-wing perspective, from a social perspective, a socialist perspective of revolution and social movements, using cordial literature, which is popular literature. And if it's popular, we understand it should be on the people's side. Now, before we leave, here's some more about Brazilian food and music on our segment Brazilianism. The first step is to clean the whole duck. Once it's nice and clean, you want to cut it up and rinse it thoroughly. Then you add the spices and saute it. It's a very tough meat, so you want to use a pressure cooker. Once it's golden brown, then it's time for the tucupi. And we add chicory, basil, and garlic to the tucupi for that extra flavor. And then jambu. Up here in the north, jambu is very popular. It's an herb that makes your lips tingle. When you chew it, it makes your mouth tingle. Then there's the chicory. Basil is an herb that has the spicy, almost minty flavor, while the chicory has that taste you can get enough of. It's served with white rice. Did you know that Brasil de Fato has a broadcast list? Add this number you see in your screen to your contacts and send us a WhatsApp message to receive the latest about Brazil on your phone. See you next week.